Like and subscribe for more info on products, sales, and training with Pierre Finkelstein. What would be the proper base coat, uh, uh, isolation coat, glaze coat, and so forth? Okay, first of all, as a base coat, stick with satin, whether or a water satin. You want something that has a little bit of absorption and you want to have something that, that, that is slow, closer system. So avoid all the extreme, avoid all the flats, and avoid all the gloss and high gloss. So in between, that's the satin. So that's the first thing. Uh, I still love the oil base coat, even working over acrylic on it because it's a closed system that is not thirsty for water. For those of us that, that, that of you that are here that took the, my class, we did all our base coat in oil and we worked everything in a water-based system and there's absolutely no problem if your oil is cure. So I always like oil because it levels much better and it, it has no transfer of moisture. When you work on water glaze over a water-based coat, there's still a lot of transfer of moisture. So you're gonna lose the open time because the base coat absorbs some of that moisture. But there, you could definitely work with a, with a satin water with a, with a glaze. I don't use isolation coat because it's a waste of time for me. It's an ad added steps. So beer glaze, okay, so there you go. For beer glaze, the specific guy was ready. Uh, so when you do your beer glaze, you don't use an isolation coat, you go over with oil glaze. And that oil glaze does not affect your base coat and, you, and, and, you, and, and, and that's it. That's the only reason why you wanna use beer, uh, beer glaze. So for, for those that are not familiar, beer glaze or gouache glaze are reversible system. So if you apply a water system that's reversible and you put acrylic on it, everything will come off. So you need to have something that does no moisture, so an oil coat. If you must isolate it because you need to go with an, the final coat with acrylic, um, John, then you can use shellac because it dries extremely fast. But you always have that little dab that if there's one little section that did not get that coat, it will come off. And so that's a big risk to take. Um, so that's, that, that would be my, 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 uh, my answer to your question. As far as glaze coat, <clears throat> in the last 10, 15 years, we, we've switched at 80 or 90% to uh, waterborne glazes because they've gotten a lot better. The open time is not nearly as good as oil, but they do not yellow, <clears throat> they don't smell. Uh, there's a lot of pluses. There's some minus, a lot of pluses. So we, we, we actually, again, it's a long thing. We, we're going to publish soon because we just finished the document, a really uh, a long winded four or five page uh, document on preparation where we talk about all those different uh, systems, how they interconnect together. We also making a video as well. So we go in great detail to all these things. But uh, to me, my basic thing is going to be an oil-based coat, satin, an acrylic glaze, acrylic glaze, and then an oil varnish at the end, or an oil varnish at, or water-based varnish, depending on what I'm doing. But uh, these acrylic glaze have gotten much better and allow you a lot of movement. All right? Hey, Pierre. So an, a good question from someone in California. What about places like that that have banned most oil produced products what do you so, recommend again yeah uh, so what i recommend is i uh, again a water-based system and what i do is i spend money on a good quality water based system. i'm not going to get your cheapest paint available i'm going to go for the i like aura by benjamin moore a-u-r-a -A. uh and again in satin is the, is i think for me the, the better one they're the, the semi gloss a little too uh, resilient, <clears throat> so I like the sun, and that's that's very good. Now, um, in California, there's a guy named Garrett that does his own paint. That's really good quality, very saturated paint. Uh, Sherman Williams has also really good coating system, but it, again, s almost spend the much that you could spend on a base coat, and it, it'll make a huge difference. Uh, uh, don't get what I call hospital paint things that are you know 
fifteen dollars a gallon, you, you're going to suffer terribly. Um, and again, your 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 money comes from profit from labor, not from from material. So the difference between a uh, sixty dollars a gallon paint and twenty five dollars a gallon paint is going to be you're going to cover in one two coats instead of fifteen coats. The absorbency is going to be much different, and your quality of work will be a lot faster. At the end, your labor is going to be reduced tremendously over the cost of $40 difference between the two gallons. Uh, any more questions from California? No, all right. Uh, what type of beer? Oh, John again. Uh, I use, um, I mean, not to name any, <laughs> any brand, but I use a stout, like a dark beer. So Guinness has been good for me because it's easy to find, but any dark stout uh, that has a lot of body, uh, the light beers, all of your Budweiser and things, they don't have enough binder. Your beer is basically the sugar, the hops. So the darker the beer in general, you're going to have the stronger binder. And that's what I work best. If, if, if you don't have that, you get plain water and gum Arabic, which comes in little jars from the art store, which is the, the binder for gouache, and it's reversible. Mix it with water. Uh, 15, 10, 15 percent of gum arabic to to water. So let's say, if you if you're making a a, a one liter or a quart of of glaze, you dump say four ounces of the gum arabic. You're gonna have a very strong uh, glaze, uh, and very fine as well. So that works really well. Uh, stale, yes. So you want to open your beer the night before and mostly to get rid of the carbonation because that, that foamy thing is gonna, you're gonna fight with the foam. So I open it up, pour it, whisk it, whisk it, whisk it, whisk it, whisk it to get all the carbonation go out and let it go stale. Let, let, the, let the, uh, the carbonation evaporate, let the sugar get thicker. You'll see it'll be sticky the next day. You may also find fruit flies all over your, your studio the next day, but uh, that's one of the uh, perks of uh, working with beer. Um, and that's the way, so the IPAs and they're a bit too light for me. Uh, don't use any of the sodas, uh, Seven Up, Coca Cola. There's so much sugar that actually you're gonna have a hard time removing it. So I, I, I did once uh, as a student uh, at a share spike use a, a, a regular Coke as my glaze, thinking it would be smarter than the others, and it took me almost a day to wipe it off with a with a scrubby, it was so strong. Plus, it, it, it has so much uh, sugar that it was discoloring the, the base. So uh, I would stay away from that. All right. 24, what is your fastest method for marbling uh, all water-based material? What is your fattest method for wood grain, all water-based materials? From Hamlin. I don't know who Hamlin is. Um, uh, so Amlin, wherever you are, this is for you. Oh, by the way, uh, I don't know if you, are you guys seeing everybody else's screen? It looked there's a view of space, like from David in Canada. I, I thought he was calling me from the, from the people, space shuttle. People can set it to, to see everybody if they like in the top. Uh, you should right. watch David's, <laughs> David's, uh, <laughs> screen. Cause I thought he was on the international space shuttle, uh, moving some, uh, huge thing. What are you doing, David? Oh my God, he's nuts, that guy. Anyway, uh, sorry, I get sidetracked with this guy. Oh no, it's like, oh, it's an electrical pole. Oh my God, <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, uh, back on it. Uh, try to, so yes, anytime you're gonna use a water-based system that dries faster will, work, will make you work faster. So in terms of marble and wood, uh, I've learned, I've learned tremendous amount of, uh, of speed by working with, the original acrylics, which had an open time of five minutes at best. So it forces you to be a little more spontaneous. It forces you to be more dynamic in your, in your, in your thing and more sure of your hand. Uh, when you learn to work with oil or a system that's slow drying, you tend to overwork over, because you have the time you use that time. So uh, again, the, the faster the medium, the, the faster it makes you work. And that's the perk of working with some of the water-based system. You, you, you're gonna make each brush 
stroke count instead of overworking. Uh, Audrey Zeher, Zeher, I'm not sure. Uh, first, I'd, I'd like to have some information about Portoro marble. How is its structure? Vein and fissure, can it still be can still be small. Do we need to shape a lot of the stone? Okay, and you crochet. That must be my Frenchie. I don't know where she is. Uh, so this is a very specific question about about a, a marble formation, which over the phone, I'm, it's gonna be very difficult for me to answer. What I would say to you though, is one of the best thing is get some, go to the, if you're in Paris, for instance, go to the Louvre Museum, there's all the, or the Versailles, and there's all the best selection of art. Take a bunch of pictures uh, and start tracing. You blow up the picture and take a tracing. Tracing is not the best thing because you're not learning, but it's a good way to get some drawing. And then you try to copy exactly what you see with a pencil or a pen over a white paper. Uh, most of my, if, if, if the question has to do with, with learning a, a, a particular rhythm for marble, or a particular uh, direction and so forth, there's nothing that's gonna be more valuable to you than the pen and paper, where you, there's no brush handling, there's no, all your concentration is on the actual visual, no color to, to deal with, no feathering of any sorts, you just concentrate on the actual shape and form only, so that's your best bet. Uh, she had another question about the Grand Antique, which is a very difficult model. It's one of the most difficult, I think, because it's just black and white and it's just fragmentation. Same thing, you, you, you try to get a piece, get a picture of it. Um, and, and, then, and then you start to have a, trying to decipher what you're seeing. So again, by, by tracing it and then, you, you get lost a little bit in your movement, you go back into it and say, what have I done wrong? And little by little, you're gonna, you're gonna really uh, get into it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get up for a second and show something that I've been doing. Uh, so, whenever I'm on the phone, and I get bored easily, uh, this is what I, again, recycled paper. I'm, I'm, I'm a big freak of recycling paper, I chase my, my admins about recycling every piece of paper. And this is what I do. So I, I draw, there's some pilasters. Uh, those are mental drawings. In other words, I'm not copying anything. Is I'm, I'm just practicing direction. I'm practicing movement. Uh, this is, you know, we had, a, we had to cancel our, wood, our marbling class, but nevertheless, I said, oh, it's good practice. So here's, here's you know, where it leads up to is the fact that, uh, there you go. Um, there you go. I'm working on something with my admin. You can see I'm working with them, but at the same time I'm drawing. So sometimes I'm, I'm just get lost in my thoughts. So all this bunch of paper, loose paper, and I start drawing. The reason I'm doing this is that it's a very good, uh, um, it's a very good and easy uh, practice, especially where you can find. You may not have access to your studio because uh, you're at home. And you don't necessarily need to have your brush and your pen. Actually, this is a good exercise. Uh, confine yourself to a frame and then start drawing and, and look at maybe a real picture on your computer, go download some picture and start drawing what you've seen. That's a good practice, all right? So I can't go really too much into the particular stone, but that's what I would do. When doing marble by marks, veins, I guess, um, don't always seem random and natural. What do you recommend? Our David Spots. Where we, there we go. I happen to be on your screen, David. Um, so again, the, the, you, you have to understand, marble is one of the most difficult and challenging because it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a random chaos that's organized, essentially. You know? So there's, it's not just vein everywhere and however it intersects, uh, you know, whatever it does. You have to draw, and this is what I always say, draw, the negative space, the, the, you don't paint the veins, you paint what's left between, you know, when three veins intersect, there's a, there's a, it's the fragment. So when I, when I, when I did, when I do those practice, I'm gonna pick one of those again, like that, I'm gonna take my, watch this, 
my little new full brushes pen. All right, so you see these shape here, these shapes, those are fragments. And that's what I concentrate on. The veins themselves, what's black, <clears throat> when, I, when I start drawing, I'm, what I'm really trying to create is these, those fragments. So, you know, I, instead of doing those vertical everywhere, like big X's, I make, I wanna say, okay, I wanna make a nice big fragment here. And then got a bunch of little smaller fragments there and then a medium one for you. So you balance on the secondary, uh, tertiary and primary fragments, but I always work fragments. And that's how, that's what, this looks like a piece of marble, even though there's no color or anything because of that. Um, so I hope I answer that, but it's practice, practice. We're gonna put a little video on this very soon because I think that's one of the, most requested and is one of the most difficult things to do. And there are some good tricks to, to be learned. Um, for the high, okay, so now from Debbie, where am I Debbie? I don't know who Debbie is. I'm, I'm, I'm just fine through, there's too many people. Uh, for highlights on the molding profile, how do you obtain your glaze with white? So for the high, the, the big misconception is to use white for highlights. The only time I use white for highlights is when I do a white marble. And that's the only way. Anywhere else, it's gonna be a color. <clears throat> and that's very important. So let's just say, give an example. You're doing a bronze or a metallic gold ornament. My highlight is gonna be a chrome yellow, maybe <coughs> a dash of of white for just to get a little more opacity and maybe a little bit of orange. So I don't want the highlights to look white. I think it's one of the missed uh, opportunity for a lot of uh, painters that they, they overuse the white, especially if say when you wood grain and you do a highlight on wood grain, there's no white, none whatsoever. Use raw sienna, a little chrome yellow, a little burnt sienna for orangeness, and you're gonna have a very intense thing. Anything that's white is gonna look completely artificial. It's gonna be painted. I don't, I don't need to be close to it. I could say right away it's painted because it's white. There's, there's no white. What seems to be white reflection on wood is actually not white. It's a light, tremendously light colors, but it's not white. It's not to say you're not supposed to use white. You can use a little, you know, you know five, 10% of white for intensity, you know, to get opacity but it's gonna be, I start my color with raw sienna, little yellow ochre, little chrome yellow, some orange or burnt sienna, and I try it. Does it read? Does it look natural? Otherwise, when it makes it unnatural. For the highlight on marble, you always wanna also use the, 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 if you're doing a red marble, like a Rouge Royale, which is mostly red, my, my highlight is gonna be a pink. It's not gonna be a white. This is gonna be a little bit of white, of course. And of course, the more reflective, there's more white. But if you really look closely, it's never gonna be pure white, all right? Uh, again, from Debbie, how much is the jump on the Munzel scale for the shadow accent and half tone? All right, so for those that are familiar with the Munzel scale, I had to look it up. <laughs> uh, it's, it's the gradient of grays. You know, so, so let's say uh, white would be 0% and black would be 100%. I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying it and in between, anything in between are your percentage of graduation. So it's hard to tell where on the, on the scale you would do, but I, I, it took me a really long time to figure this out. But I, I finally, I think I figured it out. That I start always with my half tone and my half tone is, is my, most transparent shadow, if you understand that. So it's not the most saturated shadow, it's gonna be the transparent. Let's say if you have a profile that has a sort of a curve, it's gonna be that soft transitional shadow. The drop shadow, the cast shadow, the one that's projecting onto something else, that's your strongest value. So let's go with the 80% of your work is gonna be that softer shadow. So I call it a half tone. And I used to be very washy on my half tone. I used to be like, yeah, like, and, and in fact, and as soon as I put a highlight and an accent, everything collapsed. I, I was like, why is it? And I had to go back. And so now I'm starting my half tone with a, almost a 50% value, something that it almost looks too strong when there's nothing else. 
and that's a good place to be. And then when you have your dark, it could be really strong and st strong. And then your highlight can be softer as a result. Your, your trompe l'oeil, this is very important, 80% of the volume should come through with just the shadow. If, if you need the highlight to create the trompe l'oeil, you've, you've failed somewhere. 80% of the volume, in other words, without the highlight, it should already read for the most part, 80% of it at least. The highlight is just, a, it's, it's, it's that final little glow or a little reflection and that's it. Uh, the, the shadow is the most important system. So I start kind of higher and then that can build from there. If you start very soft, too close to your original value, it's gonna be very difficult to go higher from that. Everything's gonna be very washed out because you can only build just a little value from, otherwise it's too much of a jump between your cast and your shadow. So this is for those, if you know nothing about trompe l'oeil, this probably went over your head. <clears throat> if you've done it, you, you, you understand what I'm talking about. Are there any unconventional or custom tools you've found useful while full finishing? Always, I mean, and always because I forget something and <laughs> I say, what do I have in my bag that I can use to do what I, because I don't want, I want to finish. Uh, and so, um, again, I was talking about the roller before. It's one of those things I just started using that. I just love it uh, as an applicator. I've used um, sponges, like industrial sponges, and I've started cutting them with teeth to create some movement for some graining, some mahogany, and it's perfect and super fast. I've cut any kind of plastic rubbers. Uh, recently, I did a job where I had to do a very perfect street and I used um, squeegee for clean windows and I cut them I'll post that because it's really funny and they were like two dollars I mean they were the cheapest squeegee from China I got next door and I cut them with my little tool and I had those perfect line I mean we we used a, um, a level to keep it nice and straight and it looks amazing potato bags somebody say I don't know what it means but that sounds like yeah, a crumbled potato bag, I suppose, could be useful. Um, <clears throat> I found in Japan those rubbery tools that are, that are used to, uh, I, I think in the car industry, to bondo, and they're, they're shaped like a thumb almost. I found them in some hardware store. I always go, wherever I go uh, all over the world, I'll, I always hit a, a paint store, a hardware store, and I'll just pick the most bizarre tool. And say, I'm sure there's something to be done with that. And that, that thing, it's, it's perfect for doing graining because it's, it's like an extended thumb, if you will. Uh, and then also go, go, on, <coughs> sorry, go on eBay. Um, there's, I, I, I wish Carl was here. One, a good friend of mine, Carl, up in, in Washington, he, collect, he has the biggest collection of, of decorating tools I've known to mankind. I mean, he's just like, he's obsessed. And he's just recently given me some old graining tools with German made where they actually, they're meant to make dents into your wood. You roll them so there's an actual formation. Then you glaze and wipe off and, and it fills the, the pores of the wood. Absolutely amazing. So th there's a great source to be found into old uh, material, uh, but nothing is out of reach. I mean, again, the, somebody say potato bag. I'm, I'm curious to see what they do with that, but at least you have chips and that's pretty good for your snacks. From everyone here at Faux Brushes, thanks for tuning in.